I always say that relationships are rocket ships. You can only go so far on your own. You want to go fast, go alone. You want to go far, go together. One in-person event will outdo months of Instagram. If you're a good person and you're intentional about helping people out while when they need it, they'll help you out when you need it. Today, we're talking all about the power of relationships. So to help me out, today's guest is a brand strategist for business who for thought leaders, coaches, artists, and authors who want to create impact with their ideas and get their message heard. He's the author of the Wall Street Journal bestselling book, You Are the Brand, The Eight-Step Blueprint to Showcase Your Unique Expertise and Build a Highly Profitable personally fulfilling business. Please welcome to the inspiration place. All right. So uh, let's get into today's content. You have a lot in the book, but the one part that I thought would be really valuable to focus on, because I don't think I talk enough about it on the podcast, and that is the power of relationships. And one of the reasons why I felt so important for me to talk about it right now is because all of that I've invested in relationships has helped me so much. And I know from your story, you can say exactly the same thing. You know, both of us have invested a lot in our peer relationships and our mentor relationships in all the different ways they exist. So I think this will be a super valuable conversation for my audience and you need to take it seriously what we're saying here. Okay. <laughs> very, very important. I don't talk about it enough. But really, you know, artists, they are they are they're introverts. They like to work in your in their studios. But if you look back throughout history, the most famous artists that we all can name all had a big investment in their relationships. So you look at uh Matisse and Picasso, who were hobnobbing with Gertrude Stein, you look at the French Impressionists who were all at cafes together. You look at Fra uh, Helen Frankenthaler and the other woman, the Ninth Street woman from the Abstract Expressionist movement. They were all part, uh, invested into their relationships, both up, down, and sideways. So that is what we're going to talk about today. I love it. I always say that relationships are rocket ships, right? Like you can only go so far on your own. I mean, there's a million proverbs that and, and pithy sayings that say something along those lines, right? You want to go far. You want to go fast, go alone. You want to go far, go together, right? Stuff like that. For me, relationships, what's helped me kind of navigate all that is to kind of look at it spatially. I talk about this a little bit. And it's, of course, the last chapter in the book. So it's the chapter that the least amount of people read. Right. Uh, but it's like partner up, collaborate across and mentor around. And that kind of, I'm a visual person. So that kind of helps me find myself. If I'm looking for a partner up, it's somebody that can really amplify me that probably I've got more to gain than they do. So I've got to bring something unique to the table, probably can't bring more of what they have. For example, if they have an audience or publicity or, or, you know, connections, I might not be able to bring something of the equivalent to them. So I've got to get creative, like with what I can bring, right? The collaborate across is awesome because you just kind of grow with people. Your friends grow. I mean, you mentioned our a lot of our colleagues that we met because of Selena, you know, and so like that's really cool. And the fun thing is when you know when you're friends with growing people, there's only an upside. Everyone's only getting bigger and 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 more accomplished and and can be more supportive uh, for you. I always find it funny, Miriam, when people say like. Oh, the the online world or name any subculture that we're in is so clickish and everyone just all the you know popular people hang out with each other. I'm like, no, they don't. They just went to school together. Like they have that bond because they got their start together. And so there's that level of relationship and history. They just happen to be the class that graduated before you, if you if you want to use that analogy, right? So they're not being super elitist. They just knew each other when they were all starting out. I think about my buddy Jared and we started out around the same time, 2013, and he's the co-founder of Podcast Movement, which is like the largest podcast conference in the country. To me, he's Jared. Yeah. I'm like, oh, hey, man. Good, great, great scene. And then the collaborative, uh, collaborative cross, you could do that. But then the mentor around is, of course, the people that we really coach and help and guide. They look to us. And so th those, those three levels have always helped me kind of sift through what I can bring uniquely to the table to each relationship. Okay, so I'm going to um, cue you up for each of the strategies in your book. So don't worry, this is not a quiz about what you wrote in the book. I always hate when people do that to me. It's like, what do you really think I remember? I memorized the whole thing. <laughs> uh, but before we get there, I just want to say like, 
just so our listeners understand, we wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for the way we invest in our relationships. So I hired a a, a publicist. Um, well, I've hired a few, but one of them I hired, I asked them to pitch you. And she says, oh, no, we got back this thing back saying, no, we don't take cold pitches, blah, blah, blah. So I was like, all right, well, I bet I can do better. So I just email Mike. I said, hey, Mike, remember me? We met at Selena's thing. Yeah. Forget what I said. And you're like, sure, let's meet. And, and then it was like, we're chatting like, yeah, let's swap podcasts. Now, of course, we can do that because we are collaborating across. And so we'll get more into that. But it just shows like you can hire all these people, but it's so much easier and less expensive to do it yourself. And that's what really matters. I love that you mentioned that. You know this because you went just went through a book launch and I did one two years ago. And every I think I did some like 70 some odd podcast episodes interviews for the book. They were all friends. I, I've you- hired publicists and right now like I'm beating them in the number that yeah. I've booked personally versus how many they've booked. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's like I'm going to let them run their course and then I'm going to take over again. So yeah. 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 And so that just, it just goes to show like if you're a good person and you're intentional about helping people out while, when they need it, they'll help you out when you need it. That's right. Um, and I also found like, The good people know more good people who know more good people. And so for me, like Selena is one of those people, like I can't name a single person I've met through her that I did not jive with. So if that's it, I'm a friend of her. Okay, cool. Yeah. Right. Easy. You know. Vetted. Okay. So let's talk about strategy number one, because this is really helpful to our listeners. And this is um, become someone else's best case study. Yeah. Um, Okay. I love this one. So the way my mind works if I'm working with a coach or a mentor of some sort, I'm in some sort of de- developmental relationship with them, right? They're they're trying to help me grow something in my life. Um, who are they going to pay the most attention to? The people who are paying them the most money, right? The pe- hopefully, right? The people who are paying to to work with them, and by just virtue of you paying to work with them, you you are in a smaller pool. So one of the folks that I learned from very early on, his name is Michael Hyatt. I have no idea how I found him. I think he just had good SEO and I looked up blogging and I found him and I listened to his podcast, which I thought had a gajillion listeners, right? And then I joined his email list, which I'm like, he must have like 300,000 email subscribers. And I followed him on Twitter, you know, 100,000 followers on Twitter. And then I joined his membership site and there were 50 people in it. I was like, duh. And I'm spending more time with him in that setting and it, it eventually grew. But what I realized, Miriam, was like, nobody else was really doing a lot of the work. It's- so let me just do it. And I'll probably stand out. And that's exactly what happened. And uh, you want to share like maybe one gem that's led from that relationship? I'm sure there's many. He asked me, well, first of all, he started tweeting my articles out from his Twitter account. That was was a big deal in 2012, 2013, right? That this is pre-Instagram days, pre-Instagram reels and all this video content. And so people were reading my blog. They were starting to follow me because he platformed, he essentially platformed me. And he did that because I was taking his course and I was very open about taking his course. I was like, I'm taking my kite's course and this is what it's helping me do. And he tweeted me out. And so that was really, really affirming to me. Like I was very encouraged by that. But then after a year of doing this, like went to his conference, met him. He's like, hey, we're doing a promotional webinar for the same program. Would you mind being a case study on the webinar? So I was on a webinar with him, a lot of his constituents. So Stu McLaren back then was working with Michael, building out his membership site. Now Stu struck out his own and is known as the guru for membership sites. Well, I knew him because of that initial webinar. So like we've we've connected and again, like they're they were way ahead of me where I was at that point in my career. But now it's like, hey, congrats on your success, Mike. We we're so happy for you. And they see me sort of like a respected colleague and peer. And that the nature of that relationship has changed, whereas I once used to be a student. But I couldn't buy that kind of exposure. Like when people saw me in a webinar with Michael Hyde, my own small following, they're like, oh my gosh, this guy's got it made. He's got it made. Like, wow, that's a huge deal. So I joined programs and I did the work and I became their best case study because I just figured if I had a program, that's what I would want. I'd want to be able to point to one or two superstars and say like, you know what? I was part of their journey. That's something that is priceless that you can give to a partner up like Mike was for me. I couldn't compete on numbers and exposure, but I could give him this gift 
of actually being somebody who really, really set a winning trajectory because of his programs. And that's why I'm so vocal about what he's done. So I can give a few examples of where I've been someone else's good case study. But I think what would be more instructive right now is to talk about when my students have been my best case study. So I'm always getting pitched by artists to come onto my podcast. But my guess who gets to come on my podcast? Your students. My star students. 1,000%. The ones who do the, show up and do the work and ha- and listen to me and have success. Mm-hmm. And that's why Priya Gore was on the podcast. That's why Marianne Nielsen was on the podcast. That's why Kara Gilmore was on the podcast. Like I, I could name a, a dozen more, but we'll link to them in the in the show notes. But yeah, you want to be on my podcast, join my program and be my next success story. It's it's not that hard. It's and- not that hard. And it's not hard for you to get guests because you get pitched all the time. I know you'll resonate with this. A lot of the guests I've had on my podcast are in my mastermind groups. And for many of them, I'm the first person has ever interviewed them. Yeah. And I coach them through it. So they they look like super people don't know that was their first ever interview, but I'm working with them every two weeks in a mastermind. So obviously I know them, there's a a rapport, they're comfortable and I want to see them win. That's right. And then we're just ducks making it effortless Mm -hmm. and paddling under the surface. (laughs) Yep. And then we open up time for connections like this. Right. It's like, hey, you know, it's like, I just had Laura Batoyu, who is also a friend of Selena's. I just interviewed her on, on my show. Right. And it's just this this whole world is good people, no more good people who know more good people. So let's get to strategy number two invest in more exclusive opportunities. Yes. Okay. So before I was talking about Mike Hyatt's membership site, that was, I think, $30 a month. Okay. Um, so he's obviously selling through volume. You're not getting one on one time with him. He's not really getting to know you. You're a face on a very, very large webinar call, right? But you're still in the forums. He's checking the forums and so on and so forth. There came an opportunity to join a mastermind group. And I'd heard about mastermind groups. I'd never been in one. And it was run by a guy named Marie Edwards, who was a friend of Michael's. And I felt like there was more of a direct synergy with him because he was a copywriter. And I was a copywriter. So I was like, oh, that's great. I'll kind of join his mastermind group. So now instead of being one of a thousand membership site students, I was one of 20 in a mastermind and we met every single week and we would meet twice a year in person. And I just kept doing the work and growing. And lo and behold, when it was time for me to do my first launch, Ray was like, yeah, I'll promote it and send people to your webinar. I mean, that was such an inflection point for me, um, but it's all predicated on those more exclusive opportunities. Even if it's a two-day smaller group gathering, smaller is better. If you can afford it, invest in going to a mastermind for one or two days. Um, And this, I didn't actually talk about this in the book. I've actually taken speaking engagements for events that are really small. You know, those funny events where like everybody's a speaker, yes. you know, it's like half the half the event is speakers yeah. and the other half are like the people who bought the ticket. And you're like, what are we doing here? You know, I went to a couple of those events and I, they weren't huge crowds, but there were like 15 speakers and 25 attendees. So you had about 50 people, but all I did was hang out with the other speakers and those people became friends. So it's that exclusivity Um, and you know this from speaking at conferences, you just get to know the other speakers. That is an exclusive opportunity. It's a way to connect and network. So yeah, you you just try to find those more exclusive opportunities. Yeah. So um, what Mike was just sharing was joining somebody's high-end paid mastermind to have more access uh, and a better relationship with the person running it. But what I found when I, which is absolutely true, but what I found and the reason why I joined a high-end mastermind for the first time was access to their network. Mm-hmm. So the first mastermind I joined was with Jason Van Orden. And I picked him because I knew he had a very rich network. And that's how I met Selena Sue and many, many other people who are at which eventually led to meeting Mike Kim. I think you almost joined that mastermind. Am I right about that? Yeah. Yeah. I just couldn't make it work. I remember, and I've met Jason a couple of times. And he was through somebody else. He's like this famous podcaster. When I started out, I was like, oh my God, Jason's going to be there and just introduced to him. And and yeah, it's it's just kind of crazy how that works. Like I was just, this just happened last week. I was speaking at a friend's event. It was his first event, very small event. I said, yes, I will support you. Like I want to be there. I'll promote it. And one of the other speakers, David Meltzer, um, decides to host a two-hour mastermind while we're all at the event. So I get in that room. There's eight of us. The other six six of the other eight people 
run their own conferences. And a guy comes up to me and says, Mike, I love what you're sharing in the mastermind. I saw your session. Like, I want you to speak at our event in August in Phoenix. Boom. Or I could spend seven days a week on LinkedIn pitching people to get on their <laughs> get on their stage. Right. And yeah, there's some merit to that. But my God, this is just such an accelerant. Like we sometimes forget it's just people to people. It's yeah. that simple. So David, um, I just interviewed him recently, and I don't remember if, if his episode is going before yours or after, but what we talk about is the power of in-person. There's just, there's something about it that really accelerates the relationship. It accelerates your ability to sell for, to the artists who are talk, thinking about going in person. Yes, please do it. Please. One in-person event will outdo months of Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> That's a quote, ladies and gentlemen, um, that right there, uh, you know, it reminds me of uh, when I was writing my book, I was doing some research. I met this guy named Rick Barker. It turned out he was Taylor Swift's like first manager. He's big in the national scene. And he was with her when she was just up and coming, like before she became who she was. And I'm going to, I'm going to mess up these numbers or whatever, but he basically said, Mr. Barker, I'd like to sell a million records. And he said, well, then you're going to have to meet a million people face to face. Are you willing to do that? And she was. And if you remember, she kind of got, I think she they used MySpace back then. <laughs> right. And he oh, was wow. like, some people are going back to it. Yeah. Like, and she, yeah. he was like, she would play a show and stay for hours outside and just meet every single person and talk to them. And I know she's this icon now, but her inner circle of fans, she still does that. She sends out like secret invites, no phones are allowed. And they go to her house and she plays them a private concert and it's like 50 people. And like, I've never forgotten that. Like, and here we have people who are trying to be like internet celebrities and all they want to do is like stay behind. Like Taylor Swift paid the price Yeah, to there, do in-person stuff. There's something you said in your book, I don't even remember which chapter it was, but it was so brilliant where you said um, you can't run your business from like, the box seat Yeah, and like that. Yeah. Yeah. You got to get on the field Down in the stadium. Yeah. 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 Get on the field, get in the dirt with people, walk with them. Mike Hyatt actually had this wonderful analogy. Um, you know, I, I, I lucked out. I had a good mentor right off the bat. And he said, you can adopt three different postures with your audience. You can be a sage up on the cliff, you know, speaking to the masses. You can be a Sherpa, which is a guide up and down the mountain, or you can be a fellow struggler. I loved that because it allows us the freedom to speak and share and build relationships based on our level of expertise. Like I am not a workout or body hacking expert. I'm a guy trying to stay in shape and make sure that I'm not in pain in 20 years because I didn't do the work now. I am a fellow struggler. So when I share what I'm doing with a workout, I'm not saying, hey, everybody eat your calories and track your macros. Like I'm some know it all. I don't know anything, but they resonate with me because I'm a fellow struggler. I've learned a few things about business. And so I kind of approach that as a Sherpa and I definitely know some things about personal branding. So I'll, that's where I'm, I've am i been in the space now and I can kind of share this content. That's always helped me too. And just understanding that level of relationship and where I want to speak from. Strategy three, contribute your skills to cultivate partnerships. I realized that like a lot of the big name people I've been able to associate with, that happened because I was complimenting something rather than competing with them. So Donald Miller, really well-known author, reaches out years and years ago. Can you help me with a project? I say, sure. I, I'm not that familiar with your stuff, but yeah, sure. And he was like, you were highly recommended by some friends of mine. And he, oddly enough, Michael Hyatt and this guy, Ray, that I was in a mastermind with, they're friends with him. So I came into that scenario as a contractor. I was somebody there to contribute to this guy's business. And it wasn't his responsibility to platform me in any way because I'm a contractor, but he did. Yeah. Same thing happened with John Maxwell years later. They hired me, his coaching um, company hired me to do some of their marketing. And I had my own personal brand. I had my own podcast. So I came in as a contributor and my personal brand prevented me from just being seen as the hired help. I had a body of work and I was like, hey, do you need two extra speakers for the conference? I can get these guys. And they didn't have relationships with them. So I leveraged some of my relationships to get the exec VP of Disney 
to speak at his conference. Like they're like, oh wow, Mike's way more than just the marketing guy. This is very cool. Wow. But then he platformed me. I've probably made more money from being platformed by him than what they paid me. And they paid me a lot. But some of those people, I, I saw you on John's stage because they put you on that panel five years ago and they're in my mastermind today. That's great. I love so, that. So, but if I came to John, I was like, hey, can I speak at your conference? You know, probably not going to work because he doesn't know who I am. <laughs> right? right. So, for artists and creators, we have a skill that we can often use to contribute to someone. You mentioned all these famous, legendary artists before they're hobnobbing with the elite with the wealthy because they're giving those folks something that they can't get elsewhere they're getting a, a piece commissioned for them or what whatever it is right and that's what gets you in the door yeah and one of the things um that i really loved about the book ninth street woman and i think the author is mary gabriel so they talk about helen frankenthal or lee krasner and joan mitchell and uh grace hardigan i think i got them all but i'm not sure is that they weren't just friends with other artists. They were friends with choreographers. They were friends with poets. They were friends with journalists. So it was like kind of having these little like nerd gasms when I would like, there'd be a little celebrity cameo coming up in the book of somebody that they knew. But this is exactly what we're talking about is they had relationships across platforms and there were collaborations happening and people were able to help each other and then the rising tide lift all their ships. So there's something very powerful about that. Okay, my favorite strategy is the next one, because I have a different version of this. So Mike Kim, tell us about the epic breakfast. <laughs> all right. Are okay, I love this. You didn't know what the favorite strategy was going to yes, be. Yes, I was like, which one is she going to talk about? <laughs> um, all right, so the epic breakfast, uh, I did this a number of times in cities across the US when I would be out at a conference. And more often than not, it was not a conference that I was speaking at. It was just something I was attending. So my very first one, I was attending uh, a, a two-day workshop in Nashville, but I happened to at that point, get to know a lot of people in the area. Some of the mentors I've talked about on this call, Michael Hyatt, uh, they, they live in Nashville. So I said, um, why don't I try to hold a breakfast and just invite everybody? I'll pay for the breakfast and just invite them to something where they can kind of strategize. It was almost like a mini mastermind over breakfast, sharing ideas. And that will definitely elevate me in a lot of ways. I'll be known as a connector, not just a, a speaker or a blogger or a podcaster. I'll be known as a connector. And I'll be known as somebody who, like you said, with other people like Jason, have rich relationships, have a good network. Well, how do you how do you grow a network? You gather people together, you host parties, you <laughs> become the hub and the reason why people meet. I remember at that meetup, there were like, like 15 people there. I was scared out of my mind. I was very nervous. I was like, holy cow, I can't believe all these high-end people came to this breakfast. And how I got them there was high school, just high school. All of life is high school with just more money and bigger toys. Hey, I'd love for you to come to this breakfast I'm hosting. It's invite only. There's two people I, I think um, you could meet there. Did I invite those two people yet? No. I just said, I think there's two people that are going to be there that you should really meet. Then I go to those other two people, but hey, I'm going to host a breakfast. It's on me. Like, But there's two people that I think you need to meet there. Um And I'm going to pay for everything. It's, it's all good. All you have to do is show up. And they're like, okay, cool. I'll go, actually, do you know somebody who, do you know, Mike, do you think, you can get Michael to come to our breakfast. And one of the guys got Michael to come to the breakfast. But you know what he told me? He said, are you going to Mike Kim's breakfast? I'll go if you go. It's all high school. It's just life is just high school. High school. Right? And you got to just start the ball rolling. That picture, we took a picture in front of the, after breakfast. It got plastered all over social media. There was so much FOMO. People were like, where was this breakfast? When was it? Who did this? And why wasn't I invited? And my DMs blew up that, dude, when's the next one that you're doing? I, you know, I, I want to be there, blah, blah, blah. Hilarious. That's awesome. See, I, I, all right. So I do a version of this. I don't do the social media thing. To me, it's all about I'm building relationships and I'm introducing people to each other. And I always feel like it makes me feel like Gertrude Stein. Like that, I'm the one who introduced, yep. you no, know, Picasso to Hemingway. Like that, that's the role that I like to play. And I don't, you know, I don't need everyone. I mean, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. I'm, 
probably am stupid for not doing it. So the version that I did for a whole year, every single month, um, I would pick a day. I didn't ask people which day worked for them. It's whatever day worked for me. I would pick a day for lunch. I would book a table in New York City and I would invite people and the coolest people came every single month until COVID. It really is amazing what it can do for you to be that person who connected other people because when you're not in the room, you're in the room. They all talk about you. Your name gets thrown around so much more than you ever realize. And now when it came time to get endorsements for my book, it was so easy. We like we had to cut some of them out. And I know it was the same thing for you, Mike. It's just when you, then when you need somebody, it's like now you don't have to suddenly scramble. It's just easy. Yeah. And the cool thing, I love what you said about lunch. See, I pick breakfast because there's a hard stop. You got to go to the conference for a session, but you don't want to, you don't want to I love that technique that it was like tied to a conference because I've done it when it's a conference. I usually do dinner. I like your lunch because like I like to go to bed early. Yeah. Yeah. And like dinner, dinner, like I've done even some of these locally when I was down in DC uh, and there wasn't an event tethered to it. Dinner can be a big commitment. Dinner is like, okay, who's going to get, watch the kids, you know, if they have kids, right? Like, like how long do I have to stay out? You know, and dinner is also expensive. If you're going to cover the meal, it's dinner is way more expensive, right? Oh yeah. Um, you do breakfast, whether it's locally or tied to an event. That way you don't get seen as somebody who's trying to poach off of the event. You're just holding a, a get together. You meet at seven. And the way that I do the the breakfast is like everyone gets a chance to talk. No one's having just free conversations. And I'll ask a question. Uh, one of the best questions turned out to be was, hey, what do you l- learned in the last three months that you wish you knew three years ago? That's a great question. It- Everybody goes around, 15 people share for two minutes. You're half an hour, 40 minutes in, and that's breakfast. Breakfast is almost finished. You got one more question, breakfast is over, then they can free talk and you walk back to the event. So even for those like who don't want to be tied to like some open-ended social event, oh God, dinner, what is dinner? When does dinner end? We never know, right? But hey, all right, we got to wrap it up, folks. We got to get to the first session. Let's get going. Easy. Easy on ramp, easy off ramp. It's a beautiful thing. So, and there are some great conversation starters in Mike's book. So that's your tease to get it. <laughs> okay. We have one last strategy at strategy number five, make the people you serve significant. So talk about that. What's the deal with all these coaches and quote unquote mentors out there who never platform the people that they've helped? I don't like, know. I don't get that. I don't do that. I'm always yeah. them on my podcast. Me too. And yeah. Like, and I look at, and I've worked with some of the world's best known, quote unquote, thought leaders and blah, blah, blah. And the millions of sa- in sales, millions of books sold. And, and I'm like, who is the superstar that came through this program? And how come no one knows who they are? Like Michael Hyatt put me on a webinar a year later, right? Amy Porterfield put me on a webinar because I took her Facebook ads course. If I don't see that in experts who are out there, I wonder what the deal is. And I wonder why people would ever tether themselves to them. If you really have an abundance mindset, you realize like a candle loses nothing by lighting another candle. So you mentioned Amy Porterfield. So I was, that would be my the strategy number one. I became a really good case study for her. She's giving a webinar where she's selling her own product and somebody's asking her, does this work for artists? And she's saying, yeah, Miriam Shulman was a really good student of mine on her own webinar. Yeah. And then she did it again. And the reason I know she does this is because people come to me and they become my clients after they hear her basically platform me. She had this paid a paid, not a webinar, but a paid boot camp where the VIP person was like, well, what do we do if you're an artist? She says, you should really ask Miriam Shulman. I was like, this is great. I'm going to mark this day on my calendar. Thank it's you. It's awesome. I mean, like, like really from a, a broader perspective of in, in life, like if you're going to try to squeeze and hold on to everything, you're just going to, you're just going to lose your grip on it. Yeah. Right. Like I just operating in generosity. I want the world to know that the people who work with me attain success. What kind of better marketing could there be? That's right. And then right? it comes back to her because now I'm like one of her top affiliates and I'm mm-hmm. always, you know, if I, people want to learn how to do an online art class, this is what I learned it from Amy. So, and that's like, I'm saying on my own podcast right now. So people are going to come to her and say, I heard about you on the inspiration place. Yeah. It's a virtuous cycle. You've just got to, I think people get so fixated on the numbers. We have all these vanity metrics now. I love this analogy. Actually, my friend Lauren Davis shared this and she taught social media for a while and she's really helping speakers like build their brand, you know, 
And she goes, if you were speaking at an event, who would you be most focused on? Hopefully the people who are actually at the event and not who isn't there. So she's sort of like, focus on the people who are at your party, not the ones who didn't show up. And yeah. it, you don't need to have a lot there to do big things. Like focus on the people who are there, serve them, make them significant talk about them, lift them up, right? Drop their names. And that's very fulfilling for me to do. And it, it pushes me to grow to the best of my ability so I can open doors for other people. Okay. So the last thing I just want to quote you on, um, this is not a strategy. This sounds almost like dating advice. Become someone people want to partner with. Doesn't that sound like dating advice? Yeah. Mike might be blushing, by the way. <laughs> Oh God, dating. I could say so much about that. I'm kind of a word nerd. And if you think about what the word recommend means, the root word is commend, which is to praise. So to recommend someone is to praise someone again. Like you just have to be a commendable person. Be easy to talk about, be easy going, be easy to get along with, be easy to pass on to other people. It's that simple, right? And I've met a lot of self-important people in my life, right? And especially this industry, and I'm sure you have too. Self-important people, I mean, it's just the worst. They're the worst. Like self-important people are really just, it's like insecurity wearing a jacket that says like, I'm important. It's And it's it's sad, and I have found that if you check your own vibe, your own frequency, and you're doing the work on yourself, you don't just build a brand, you become the actual person you're passing yourself off as, things tend to fall into place and relationships become easy and relationships grow quickly. That's, I feel like I've known you for years, right? And you, you have that you have commonality. New Jersey and we common. Have New Jersey. And then we find that out and we're like, oh, oh my gosh, this is, this is where were we? all each other's lives, right? But it's surprising how quickly your circles can change as a result of that if you're just a recommendable person. And that's it. I love that. I usually say, give me last words for our listeners, but that might be it. All right. So everybody, please go get You Are the Brand by Mike Kim. Excellent. Uh, we just did the last chapter. The first nine are also really good. And we link to that in the show notes, or I guess you can just skip the show notes and go to Amazon. Most people do that. Uh, do you have it? Do you actually have any last words for my listeners? Yeah, I do. This might seem a little bit off, but that's kind of how I live my life. Life is short but it's the longest thing we ever do. Have good food, spend more time with your loved ones, never pass up a great adventure. I know we're building businesses and we want to we don't want to leave our mark on the world and those things are like, you know, lofty and and noble things. But in reality, like all we have is is this moment is now, right? So live in it. So that's what I would say. It's that's helped me a lot, Miriam, kind of tone down some of the intensity that Enneagram 8 you know, and learn how to be a little bit more present and content and happier and fulfilled. And hopefully that resonates with some of y'all out there. All right. Okay. Thanks, Mike, for being with me here today. And thank you, my friend. I will see you the same time, same place next week. Until then, stay inspired.